Hi everybody, this is uh, part one of a lecture on introduction to poetry. Um, the uh, first thing I want to talk about as far as poetry goes is uh, the fact that when we're children, we like poetry. <laughs> um, does this look familiar to anyone? Shel Silverstein, classic poet for children. Dr. Seuss, poet for children, poems, nursery rhymes. We like poems. We like um, rhyming words and uh, the repetition and the rhythm and the song-like nature of nursery rhymes. Um, and then what happens? We get to school, later in school, and Shakespeare comes along. <clears throat> we get to Sonnet 116, which says, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when that alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove, blah, 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 blah. And it all kind of sounds like a riddle. And sadly, we learn not to love poetry. We learn to fear it or to dislike it or to think that it's not for us. Um, and that's that's really too bad. So part of one of my goals in this, this talk and in this unit is to help kind of turn that around and to convey to you that um, poetry is for you because there are all kinds of, there's all kinds of poetry. Um, it's like saying television isn't for me. Um, there are all kinds of TV shows. There's something for everyone and the same is true in poetry. Take a look at this painting, Jackson Pollock. It's a, a lot of people when they see modern paintings like this, they feel um, maybe put off like, huh, what is this? I don't understand. I don't see anything. <laughs> it's not like a painting of a bowl of fruit or a vase of flowers. Um, I don't get it. Um, but what if my proposal to you is that um, it's okay. What if it's okay not to get it? Or if there may be nothing to get, or if it's just you look at this painting and you think, that's an interesting assembly of colors and shapes, and I really like that shade of orange, and that's okay. Um, but a lot of people are put off by this because we're always looking for meaning. And sometimes art isn't about meaning necessarily, or it's more about making your own meaning. I'll talk about that more later on. Um, one thing I want to talk about is, is the sounds of language. Um, poetry is meant to be read aloud. Um, and even if it isn't read aloud, we're still meant to hear the sound of language in our heads. I'll tell you what I mean, because many of us, if you grew up speaking English, you don't listen very carefully to the sounds of English. Um, so here's a little experiment. I want you to ask yourself, which of these two words sounds funnier to you? Okay, I'm going to just put some words up on the screen. Pickle or mint? Pickle or mint? If you answered pickle, if you thought pickle, then you are correct. <laughs> it is funnier. I don't know why that is. There's something in the ickle that is funny to us. It's just funny. Look at these two. Vanilla or sherbet? If you're thinking sherbet, you're right. It is funnier. Sherbet. There's something in that that makes us think, you know, makes us react. Like, that's a kind of a weird sound. The herbit. Uh, maybe because it sounds like a frog or the name Herbert or something. Um, vanilla is just not a very funny sounding word. Now, I'm not talking at all about the meanings of these words yet. How about medicine or rutabaga? Rutabaga is a little funnier, isn't it? Right. Fricassee or bake? You're probably thinking fricassee. Maybe because it's a foreign word. It just sounds funnier. Hemoglobin? Snowboard. Hemoglobin. It just sounds funnier. So my goal, oh, Florida or dill. This one is a little bit, maybe a draw. Florida. I like the way people from New York 
say Florida. They pronounce it Florida. We're going down to Florida for the weekend. Um, dill is also kind of a funny sounding word. Maybe that one's kind of a draw. This is a, um, this poem, if I control the internet, I'm going to send you this link, um, in the email where I send you this talk. Um, it made me ask the question, can you still love something you don't really understand? You'll see what I mean when you watch him, this, this man, um, his name is Reeves, when he delivers this poem that he wrote, um, it's really amazing and it's hard to understand and he's all over the place, but it's still enjoyable. So, moving on to talking about the sounds of, of language. I'm gonna put some more words up on the screen. You tell me which of these words sounds more euphonic, which means soothing, appealing to the ears. Which of these words do you just find more agreeable to your ears? Sunburn or bats? Sun, just listen to the words, sunburn, bats. You're probably thinking sunburn. Even though like you hear the word sunburn and you think, ooh, that's bad, I don't like that. Probably bats too. But sunburn is a more soothing sounding word than bats. Bats is kind of harsh. Fricative or euphoria. Obviously, euphoria is fricative. A fricative are sounds like f, k, sh, t, which, not coincidentally, are the words that make up most cuss words. Think of your favorite cuss word right now. I, I'm betting it has one of those sounds, k, sh, t, f, in it, right? because those sounds are pleasing to make. Um, and they're not very euphonic. They're not very soothing, but they're not supposed to be because you're swearing at somebody. Sibilance or bumper pool. Those two are pretty close. Sibilance. The, the S sound is soothing to us. Um, but the B, the bumper pool, the rhythm of that is kind of nice too. That one's maybe a draw. Cockfight or cemetery. Cemetery, right, is more euphonic. Cockfight has a lot of fricatives in it. K, f, t, right, harsh sounding. Schust or flick talk. Schust, right, schust is more euphonic. That's a word, Those, both of those words I just made up. Um, just to get you away from thinking about the meaning of them. But flick talk is a harsh sounding word. So, yeah, like I said, S, the S, sh, O, and M, M, or N, or TH sounds are all pleasing to us. A couple of lines from a poem that we're going to look at in a minute. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. It's a pleasant sounding couplet, isn't it? Sounds the sweep, easy wind and downy flake. It's beautiful. <clears throat> So, words you don't like the sound of. Moist is number one, right? A lot of people hate the sound of this word, moist. Uh, I'm not sure why, but it makes people uh, kind of queasy. Um, these are words I got from students in class recently. Couch, squeamish, <laughs> discharge, kumquat. There's a harsh sounding word, kumquat, wart. Wart. It's an unpleasant thing and it's a, with an unpleasant sounding name. What about words you love the sound of? Think of words that you like the sound of. This is maybe easier for someone who learned English as a second language because people who learn come to English as a second language, they listen to English actually a lot more than native speakers. At least they did when they were learning it. Hooligan. Verithane, lollygag, buffer zone, swish, nibble. Um, so these are, it's very, um, it's very personal, obviously, words you like or don't like. Um, but it's, it's more personal than those other lists, the sweet sounding, or the soothing sounding, or the harsh sounding ones. Um, 
I'm going to send you this link also in an email um, that has to do with the sounds of foreign languages. It's interesting that to native English speakers, certain languages are soothing to the ear, more soothing to the ear than others. For example, French, um, Spanish, Italian um, are languages that native English speakers are kind of drawn to. Uh, Russian, perhaps. Other languages like Mandarin or German um, have a lot more harsh sounds than the ones I mentioned before. Um, certain languages get associated with historical periods and can evoke uh, reaction. For example, if you hear, unfortunately, when many Americans hear the sounds of Arabic, um, given you know, the war on terror and what people see on television and what they the ideas that they have about, about the Middle East and people who speak Arabic, they have negative associations with that language, as, as it was and still is to some degree to, with German. Um, people think, oh, German sounds like the people in World War II movies that I've heard, and they happen to be Nazis. Um, so it's interesting how languages can evoke strong emotional reactions in us. Okay, everybody, that's the end of part one. In uh, part two, we'll start looking at actual poems, talk a little bit more about how to uh, read and hear and appreciate poems.